there this morning. I want to take uh, a couple minutes and also thank um, Abby, my wife, and uh, Michelle for hanging out with the kiddos this morning. Thank you, Clifford, for meeting all our audiovisual needs again this morning. Um, We're in uh, Genesis 2, and to give you a little roadmap where we're going these next few weeks, we're going to look at uh, our sermon series over over Christmas time. It's called Ladies of the Lineage, um, Ladies Who Were in the Ancestry of Jesus Christ. So we'll look at Eve this week. Next week, Lord willing, um, Rahab and Ruth, the following week, will, um, and then the fourth one will be Mary, Jesus' mother, and then, of course, on Christmas Day, we'll examine something surrounding Jesus and the Christmas story. Uh, just a reminder, our Christmas service is at 11 o'clock that day, and not 10 o'clock. Um, that should give, on Christmas morning at 10, 10.30, you're ready to get out of the house anyway, so uh, we'll... We'll move it up back to 11. Um, we're in uh, Genesis chapter 2. Let me read verses 18 through 25, and then we'll pray and get after it. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heaven and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock, and to the birds of the heaven, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs, and closed up its place with the flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Uh, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, even as we examine this passage and subsequent verses this morning, we ask that you would open our hearts to the word. Lord, we, we need help hearing it. We need help applying it and obeying it. Lord, might it do good to our hearts this morning and throughout this week and throughout the season, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. As of late September 2022 this year, Ancestry.com reportedly had 20 million users and its uh, similar site, 23andMe, reportedly had 12 million users. Now you do the math there, that's about 32 million people and that's roughly... 10% of the American population, obviously a smaller percentage of the world's population, which is uh, recently crested at 8 billion people. Um, So we've seen an uptick of late in interest in one's genealogy. Where did we come from? For some, it's a quest in curiosity. For some, it's uh, brought on by other factors. Maybe a medical diagnosis that now requires some curiosity about family history. Um, This recent uptick in uh, curiosity of one's ancestry is frankly out of the norm for most of the world and most of human history. The West is an anomaly in that respect in that most Cultures, by and large, over the last 2,000 years, have done yeoman's type labor to keep up with their own genealogy. In the East, in particular. It's important, many say, to find out who, who, you, who you come from. As the saying goes, um, for some of us, I've got Jesus in my, bo- Jesus in my heart but grandpa in my bones. 
I've got Jesus in my heart, but Grandpa in my bones. Whether we realize it or not, who we come from affects who we are. And who Jesus comes from tells us a lot about who he is. And so examining this first person, Eve, we want to learn more eventually about her son, Jesus Christ. This morning we'll look at Eve at creation, Eve at the fall, and Eve at redemption. So Eve at creation, Eve at the fall, and Eve at redemption. One of the thir- first things we learn about Eve is that she is made in God's image. God makes Adam, God makes Eve, and he says in Genesis 1.27, So God created man in his own image, in the image of God He created him. Male and female, he created them. The scriptures tell us that that Eve is made in God's image. She is made to reflect him. She is made for for honor, dignity, worth, and work. Good work, I might add. Eve is not a a product of uh, macro evolution or biological chance. She is a work of fine art by our Father's own hand. That should tell us something about Eve. Eve is majestic. She is honored. The psalmist would pick this up in Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have created man and made him a little lower than the angels. You have given him honor and glory. Eve is not someone to be looked down upon, but she is made for honor, honor, dignity, and worth. Notice also how she was made. Look in verse, num- in verse um, number 21. So the Lord God caused a deep seat to fall upon Adam. So Adam's not involved in this process at all other than sleeping and providing a, a little bit of material. And while he slept, God took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, and I bet in some of your copies of scripture, these next few words are set apart. This is at last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. She'll be called Isha because she was taken out of Ish. At last, Adam has found Someone who is a counterpart to him. He's been naming and working with all these animals. Elephants, lions, tigers, and bears. Oh my. And now Adam can't find someone. That person's not like me. That, or that animal's not like me. That animal's not like me. That animal definitely isn't like me. I'm all by myself. And God says it's not good for a man to be alone. I will create Eve. And I will... They. They... This is where the marriage mandate comes from, that a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. The Yorkshire Ballad says this, she was, she was not took out of his head, sir, to reign and triumph over man, nor was she took out of his feet, sir, by man to be trampled upon. But she was took out of his side, sir, his equal and partner to be. Eve is not Less than or inferior to Adam, she is equal to and corresponding to and a fit for Adam. She is made in the image of God just like Adam is. And out of this, it's interesting to note that historic Christianity, especially in the first century, treated women much better than the surrounding culture. For most of history, women have been treated like property or or chattel, or a servant, but not so when Christianity came along. Our own Proverbs 31 shows a a measure of dignity and a measure of fortitude and a measure of entrepreneurship. So I I, want to ask, in our church especially, how, how do our ladies feel? Do our ladies feel honored? Do they feel lifted up? Do they feel dignified? Do they feel like a part of the decision-making process? I hope that's the case here. I hope this is a case where women who are 
who this world does not treat well can come and be a part of our community and this church can say, yes, you are full of dignity, worth, and honor, and we will treat you as such. I hope that's the case. And Eve at creation, Eve is, um, she's named Eve. She's named the mother of all living. There's an exercise here between Genesis 1, where God says, I want you to be fruitful and multiply, and Eve's work of bearing children. We have a common relative, and her work is important. We have a common relative, and her name is Eve. Eve is the mother of all living. She is made in the image of God. Therefore, we are made in the image of God. And I don't want us to go over that too quickly. Being made in the image of God makes a difference how we treat each other. It makes a difference how we treat those who do not follow Jesus Christ. It makes a difference how we treat our little ones. It makes a difference. It should set us apart from the rest of the world, from those who the world says, those people are not important. The world says those people are not worth our time. They're inconvenienced. That should not be the case with Christ Church because Eve, as well as the rest of us, are made in the image of God. That's Eve at creation. Let's look at Eve at the fall. Um, one of our family's favorite movies, and I'm, I'm glad this has come about this way, one of our favorite Christmas movies is Elf, uh, starring Will Ferrell and a host of other uh, folks. I think that movie's going on like 20 years old, something like that, believe it or not. But there's, um, for, for those not familiar with the story, it's, it's a story, it's not real life, uh, it's a story about uh, a human who was accidentally transported to Santa's workshop and was raised by elves. Uh, and, and after he grows up and he's, he's no longer elf size, he begins to ask some questions. He doesn't look like the elves. He doesn't work like the elves. He's not skilled like the elves. Um, and he goes off on a quest to find his biological father. And as you might imagine, his biological father is not at all thrilled about this. Not at all. He's a publisher. He works. He's a, he's a, He's a high-level uh, worker for a publisher under pressure, and it comes out. And at one point in the movie, Buddy the Elf uh, barges in on one of his meetings, and, and that does not go well. Um, at one point, the dad says, I want you to leave. I don't care who you are. I don't care that you're my son. I want you to get out of my life and never come back. And at that point, the first time I saw the show, I was, what just happened? That was mean. And um, I'm not going to tell you how it ends. You have to go watch it yourself. But um, at, at, at that point, I was thinking, um, as someone who's worked in the corporate world and as a dad, um, one, not good to yell at your kids. Number two, uh, even worse, not good to yell at your kids in public in front of your coworkers. And number three, can't take that back. Can't take that back. The word's out. You know, one of, one of the things they taught us at a 12-year-old, as a 12-year-old in Western Pennsylvania in my hunter safety course is once you shoot that gun, once the bullet comes out, you can't get it back. Can't get it back. Once the words came out, you can't get it back. There's some stuff that we say, there are certain things that we do that we cannot get back. And unfortunately, Eve was a part of that first awful process. Everything was going along swimmingly. Adam and Eve were enjoying each other's company in the perfect marriage. They had the perfect job. Tend the garden, be fruitful, multiply. No sweat, no hardship, no curse. They were naked and not ashamed. They were living with perfect harmony with one another, perfect harmony with their work, perfect harmony with their surrounding, fulfilling their image-bearing, and most of all, enjoying perfect heavenly fellowship with their heavenly Father. He would come and walk with them in the cool of the day, and they would have perfect, unbroken fellowship with Him. No distractions. No, can you imagine when you're praying, no distractions? Can you even imagine that? But what happens, we, if you've been around the Bible at all, you know the story. The serpent comes along and he says, you know, did, did God really say 
you shouldn't eat of that fruit. Did God really say that? You know why he said that? Because he's holding out on you. He knows that when you eat of it, you shall not surely die, but you'll know good and evil. And this, he just wasn't saying, hey, you'll experience good and evil. He'll say, you will be the arbiter of good and evil. You will be the judge of good and evil. You will be the ones who will get to be God and decide what is right and what is wrong. And it says, when Eve saw the fruit, it says in chapter 3, verse 6, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. And he ate. They both ate. And what happened next? The text, the narrative says, then the eyes of both of them were opened. This is not a good process. And they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves one cloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves. But the Lord God called to the man and said, where are you? Can you imagine this set of firsts? You know, when you, when you go on your first date, that's awesome. When you have your first kid, that's great. When you go on your first roller coaster, amazing. Can you imagine this set of firsts? It's the first time to experience shame. It's the first time to experience finger pointing and blame shifting. It's the first time to experience fear, anxiety, loss. Can you imagine that? And now Eve is specifically cursed in, in the end of chapter 3. I will surely, God says, multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. There's all sorts of relational, um, relational shrapnel going on here. All these ramifications, shame, loss of dignity, loss of worth, Hardship and work. The person who is closest to you now becomes the object of your blame, the object of your scorn. And don't we feel that today? Don't we feel that today? Relationships are difficult. Suspicions arise. Why do we get mad at our children? The ones who are closest to us, and frankly, the ones who are the cutest in our families. We get mad at them. Why do, we get mad? Why do wives get mad at husbands? Husbands get mad at wives. Why is work hard? Why won't that spreadsheet do itself? Why does the printer jam at the time I want it? Why do I want to throat punch my middle manager? Because of the fall. Can you imagine all these other firsts? The first pregnancy. The first childbirth. How do you handle that? There's no manual for that. This curse affects Eve it, with Adam, Eve with God, Eve with a garden. And, and also, I think we overlook this, this curse affected Eve with Eve. And sometimes we are our own worst enemy. This affects her progeny as her first, as her first children, one would murder the other. It would affect the entire cosmos now in Romans 8. The entire universe groans and aches for a restoration. Can you imagine this guilt? Can you imagine what she went through? You know, it's like that song from Skillet, Monster. I feel it deep within. It's just beneath the skin. I must confess that I feel like a monster. I'm going to lose control. I must confess that I feel like a monster. Can you imagine the shame and the ache of Eve knowing she messed up everything for her. She messed up a perfect situation. Immediately after eating the fruit, everything falls apart. But Eve has not, listen to this, Eve has not lost her image bearing. It is simply marred by sin. 
She is still created in the image of God, but now sin affects and infects everything. She is not as bad as she could be, but sin affects her mind, her emotions, her body, her spirit, her soul. So what happens next? You know, frankly, if we just left Eve there, if God comes down in the garden and says, Adam and Eve, where are you? And they come out and say, hey, this fruit's pretty good. Why don't you tell us more about that? He would have been perfectly just to just hit the reset button and start everything over. God would have been proper in that justice. But the story doesn't leave Eve there. And most importantly, God doesn't leave Eve there. Look at verse um, Genesis 3, 14 and 15. God is addressing the serpent. Because you've done this, because you've deceived me, because you've marred my creation, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is significant here. God comes to Adam and Eve and he asks a question. And his question isn't a fact-finding mission. It is a question of conviction, but it's a que it is a question as an invitation to restoration. Eve and Adam had sewed for themselves loin claws out of leaves. Those leaves would eventually wither and they would need new ones. But God comes and he promises and he provides. God promises here in 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Ultimately, one day, the seed of the woman would come and he would crush the head of the serpent. That's a death blow. And it was a literary device that means he won't just crush the head of a serpent. He will do everything to restore what the serpent has marred. Everything will be back. Renewed relationships with others, with yourself. Renewed relationships with the culture and with, with the garden. In spite of all of what's gone on. And you know what? Eve believed God. Look in Genesis 4. I want you to see this. Genesis 4 verse 1. Genesis 4 verse 1. I, I, I'm not sure what... The version you're using, I'm going to read it out of the ESV. Now, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. Now, depending on what, what um, translation you're working with, it probably says something like, I've gotten a help with a man with the help of the Lord. I've gotten a man with the help of the Lord. I've gotten a man from the Lord. Something along that nature. Well, you know what? Those, those prepositions with the help or from are not in the original Hebrew. They're not there. They're supplied by a translator. The way we would read this verse literally is this. Now, Adam and Eve knew his wife. She could see the boy Cain saying, I have gotten a man, comma, the Lord. I've gotten a man, comma, the Lord. He believed that this child would be the, the fruit of the woman come to crush the head of the servant. She thought this was it. Obviously, we know in hindsight that it was not, but she believed the promise. And through the years, down century after century after century, mankind and God's people in particular would groan and hope and wait for the coming of God's promised Son. And I want you to see a, a neat touch as we close here. God says, in verse, he doesn't make a promise, he makes a provision. God curses Eve, he curses Adam, he curses the serpent first, gives us the first gospel, and says in verse 20 of chapter 3, the man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Verse 21, and the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. The self-righteous efforts that would result in rotting in making leaves, no longer were necessary. Through the death of one, God would ultimately give clothing to Adam and Eve. That would be a precursor when God would give us, his people, clothing. No longer would we be 
dressed in the filthy rags of our own righteousness, but we would be given the righteousness of the promised Son, Jesus Christ. Do you know what Advent means for us? Advent means God comes to us in our greatest need to meet our greatest guilt. God comes to us in our greatest need to meet us in our greatest guilt. The, one of my favorite carols, and I'll close with this, is uh, my choir in college sang it. What sweeter music can we bring than a carol for to sing? The birth of this, our heavenly king. Awake the voice, awake the string. Dark and dull night, fly hence away and give the honor to this day that sees December turned to May. That sees December turned to May. The darling of the world has come, and fit it is, we find a room to welcome him. And all the heart of all the house, here is the heart, which we will give him and bequeath this holly and this ivy wreath to do him honor, who's our king and lord of all this world. Let's pray again. Father, you met us in our deepest guilt, and you still come to us today. That act we did, that thought we had, that we would be completely ashamed and embarrassed and humiliated to be admitted to the whole world that you know in detail. You, you came to us for that. And through Eve, you would bring a son, and his name is Jesus. And he would be the one who would crush the serpent's head. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for finding us and for not being content at our own works, but replacing them, for doing away with them, for giving us the work of your son, Jesus, so that we could be clothed in honor and righteousness and dignity. We thank you. We praise you for this. And we give honor to you our King, in Jesus' name.